Uh, well, grace and mercy and peace be with you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the United States, uh, Americans, American households carry about $16 trillion of consumer debt. Uh, broken down, that's approximately $97,000 per household on average that has debt. Most of that debt coming from mortgages, car loans, and student loans. Now, I suppose a good news story, and this is that 25% of households in America are debt-free. Uh, but, you know, whether you owe somebody financially or you just owe somebody something, I think all of us are indebted in some regard to someone or someone else, or some, something or someone. You know, even, even if you don't own the bank money or owe the bank money, uh, Maybe somebody took you out for lunch and you said at the end of lunch, hey, the next one's on me. Or you borrowed a tool from a neighbor and you said, hey, next time you've got a project, let me know, I'll be there to help you. I called up my dad the other day to ask him if he would do a favor for a friend of mine and he said, sure, no problem. He'll just be indebted to me for the rest of his life. Oh, gee, thanks, dad. You know, that'll be convenient. <laughs> Who do you owe? Uh, being in debt is like a, a form of slavery. It's burdensome. Actually, Proverbs 22.7 says that the borrower is slave to the lender. That debt is burdensome. It, it, it's consuming. And, and even if you have things in your possession and you, you still are paying on them, you don't even fully own them until you've paid it off. So who do you owe and what do you own? These are questions we're going to be considering today as we consider our relationship with God and as we take a look at the conclusion to the story of Ruth. So some of you have been with us over the last month as we've been reading through Ruth and studying it. Some of you are just popping in here today for the first time. Uh, if, if that's the case, go home and read the story of Ruth. It'll take you maybe 15 minutes to do it. Uh, it's a great, great read. But here we are at the conclusion of this story. And uh, so far, we, we've really met two kind of uh, main parties, two main characters. There's, there's the women, uh, Ruth and Naomi, and they are both widows, which in ancient Israel meant that they were destitute and they were in, uh, in, in dire need of, of help and support. And then we also have Boaz, who is a kind, wealthy, well-respected man. And up until this point of the story, he's been really taking care of Ruth and Naomi and, and tending to them. But things got serious in chapter 3 when Ruth formally asked Boaz to redeem her, to be her redeemer. Now, we covered this last week, just, just again, real quickly, because it's this can get a little confusing. In ancient Israel, uh, having a redeemer was a legal thing, a legal right. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if somebody died, uh, if a man died, his widow uh, would need to be redeemed, which would mean bought back by the closest relative of her widow. And, and then he would, he, he would have the option to buy it and, and maybe buy the land that, that uh, belonged to the husband and then uh, own that land and own the people in a way, but then also own the inheritance and the next generations and pass on uh, the name to the next generation. So when Ruth is asking for Boaz to redeem her, this is what she's asking. She's asking for Boaz to, to purchase her and then to purchase Naomi, to purchase this land so that their inheritance could pass on and on and on to the next generation. And at the end of chapter 3, Boaz said, yes, I'm willing to do this. However, there is a closer relative to Elimelech, the, the deceased husband of Naomi, and I've got to go talk to him first. So here in chapter 4, Boaz goes to the city gate where they would do business transactions, 
and he finds this other relative of, of Naomi's. And he goes up to him and, and presents to him only part of the deal at first. He says, Naomi, remember her husband Elimelech, who's both of our relatives, he died, and Naomi's selling the parcel of land. And this, and this other redeemer says, I'll redeem that, which means I'll buy that, I'll buy that land. But then Boaz slips in. He goes, well, also, if you buy the land, that also means that you're going to be redeeming Ruth the Moabite, the foreign woman, and in order to perpetuate the name of Elimelech and his sons on to the future, you also have to purchase her back. And so the, that other relative says, I can't do that. I've got some other legal obligations with my own family, my own inheritance. So no, Boaz, you can redeem her. So long story short, we just read it, and you can read it again, but Boaz redeems her. It means he redeems the land, but he also marries Ruth. And then he and Ruth have a child, and they name that child Obed. And the women of Bethlehem come to Naomi, and they say to Naomi, Naomi, you who were bitter are now blessed. You who felt like God had rejected you, now you've been redeemed. There is a, a son, a grandson, born into your family for your family inheritance and your name to be passed on to the next generations. And then, at the end of chapter 4, something that if you were reading this on your own, perhaps you'd probably just close the book before even reading this. There's a little bit of genealogy there at the end of the story. And a lot of people just close these things up and don't read it because it's just a list of names. But it's here to serve as a lasting history, a true story of the significance of what just occurred. Because we find out that Obed becomes the grandfather of King David. And Ruth, therefore, the great-grandmother of King David. And if you go and read in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, the very beginning of the Gospels, the story of Jesus, it tells the genealogy of Jesus, our Redeemer. And guess whose names are listed there? Ruth and Boaz and Obed. Okay? And so the, the point of this, the reason that we're even studying this story is to show you that God is a God of redemption. And there are redemption stories that occurred in the family line of the Redeemer of the world, our Savior Jesus Christ. So let's talk about redemption. At the outset of this sermon, I asked you, who do you owe and what do you own? And I asked you this, not just in regards to your relationship with the bank, but mostly with your relationship with God. Who do you owe? Well, technically and legally, according to the law of God, you are indebted to God. Your sin, your sin stacks up. Your sin, it, it, it stacks up according to the law of God. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And so you owe God your life. You owe him a death sentence because of your anger, because of your pride, because of your jealousy, because of your hatred, because of your production of other gods in which you put your hope, because of all of your slander and your lies, all of it, all of your sin adds up to a debt that you cannot pay. You can't afford it. You are broke and you are deep in debt. To God, the debt is too big too burdensome, too crushing. Your sin costs too much. You cannot afford it. But Jesus is your redeemer. Jesus is your redeemer. Like Boaz, the redeemer of Ruth and Naomi, buying them back from the brink of something they could not afford, from burdened to blessed, from bitter to belonging, from owing to owning. Jesus is your redeemer. He purchased you. He paid your debt 
by dying for you. Do you understand your sin costs life? And that is why Jesus laid down his life. And he didn't get you on sale. He didn't wait for a doorbuster Black Friday deal. He paid full price for you. It's like this. It's like it's like if you're sitting at home one day and the dog starts barking. You think what's going on and you look out the front door and it's the mailman. <laughs> He's dropping off the mail. So you go out and check the mail. I know the highlight of your day. Who gets regular mail anymore, right? But you go and check the mail and ah, it's just another bill. So you go in to the dining room table dreading opening up this piece of mail. And when you do, when you open it up, this is what you find. An invoice from God. It's a bill to you from God. You've purchased a lot of sin. <laughs> You've done it a lot. And because of that, you owe your life. <sighs> Dread comes over you and you think, I'm too broke. I can't afford this. And so like you might do if you were destitute, you might call up the company or call up the bank and beg and plead and say, I'm so sorry that I racked up so much debt. I can't afford this. Can I, can I get on some sort of payment plan or, or something? What can I do to make this better? I'll, I'll get it right. I, I will. And so you call up God <laughs> And you do the same thing. God, I'm so sorry. I beg and plead you for your mercy. And God says, deal, paid in full. I give up my life for you. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid for your life with his own life. Your debt is paid, burden lifted. You are free. You owe him nothing. You can contribute nothing, and now you owe him nothing because of the precious blood of Jesus given and shed for you. And then God takes it even a step further in your conversation. He says, not only is your debt paid, but actually, you have incredible assets. And so he hands you a statement of your assets. And he says, look, this is actually what you own. You owe nothing, and this is what you own. You are a child of God and therefore an heir. Look, it says in Romans 8, if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ? Because you're a child of God, you are an heir along with Christ of the things of God, which is the second thing, God's eternal kingdom. As we read in Hebrews 9, those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. You deserve death and yet Christ died for you and therefore you inherit eternal the eternal kingdom of God it is given to you and finally forgiveness Ephesians 1 says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace you are redeemed and purchased back from sin you owe God nothing. Jesus paid it all for you, and you receive all of this. It is given to you. It is your inheritance. Redemption is an incredibly freeing thing because it means you owe nothing, and you own everything. You owe God nothing according to your sin. What you do owe Him is an incredible life of gratitude. You know, as we enter a week of giving thanks here, it begins here. It begins at this place where we, where we recognize that we are nothing without Jesus. 
He pays for it all and he gives us all of this. That ought to create in us an overwhelming attitude of gratitude and therefore a life of generosity lived in praise of God and in purposeful living for him. Redemption, it is an incredible gift from God and it's, it's an all-encompassing gift. You know, when Boaz went to that first redeemer, that, that closer relative, and he, that, the closer relative was willing to redeem a part of it. He was willing to redeem just the land. <laughs> Boaz was willing to redeem the whole thing, the land, the people, the possessions, and the inheritance to raise up faithful children who would lead to the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus' redemption is all-encompassing. No one is left out of the redemption of Jesus. Jesus' redemption is for you and for your household and for your children and for those who are far off. Jesus has already paid for them. There is no debt too big, no sin unforgivable, no person irredeemable. Every life has redemptive value. Every life. You know, in the movies or in books, we love redemption stories. We, we love to see people who, who are on the brink or who are on the outside, who, who seem to have nothing left, and then they make it, and their life turns around. We love those kinds of stories. But sometimes in real life, we have a harder time acting that out. We're too quick to look at the lives of people and think, no, that sin is too big. That, that is too grievous. I don't know that God could fix your life. I don't know if it's got redeemable value too quick in our sinful judgment. We put that upon people. When God has said, no, every life has redeemable value, no sin too great, no debt too big, no life irredeemable. God just wants you to open up the mail, acknowledge your sinful reality, come to him and say, I cannot pay this debt. And Jesus will say to you, your debt is paid. You are free. You owe me nothing. But you own all of this. Now live your life with purpose. Put it to good use. Put your possessions to good use. Let your home be a home of peace. Let your car take you to places to proclaim the name of Jesus. Let your whole self live as one who has been purchased and redeemed with the blood of Jesus Christ. You are redeemed people. You belong to him. You owe him nothing you own the inheritance of the kingdom. Let us give God thanks for purchasing and winning us back from sin, death, and the devil, and let us live as his redeemed people. In Jesus' name, amen.